and off to a good start. Amen. I think it was Brother Lacey who said on the introduction one day time to a church that that was such a great introduction that he can't wait to hear himself. <laughs> but I so appreciate Pastor, and um, I am thankful for the Lord for what he's done for me through salvation Amen. and helping me to grow. And, you know, I, I thank Pastor, too, for, like, the time he invested in me and, and the confidence he showed in me and, and the trust that he showed in me to, to be up here. And Amen. I thank the Lord for that, and I count it a privilege. I love you all, and um, I'm so thankful. Let's stand. We're going to continue our, our series in the book of Acts. We're going to go back to verse 1 of chapter 1. And let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege it is to be in your house today. It's a beautiful day. It's a good day to be amongst your people. Thank you for the word that we, that we heard preached this morning on the cross, on Golgotha, Calvary. So thankful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Without him, none of this would be possible. And we just pray now, Lord, for hearts today. Lord, I, I, I pray that people are attentive. I know it's hard, the afternoon service after brunch, but I just pray, Father, that everyone will give their attention and I know, Lord, that they would be uh, blessed from what you have for us today. We love you. Help me, Lord, to be clear and concise. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, would thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons for which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Thank you. You may be seated. So today, in Acts chapter 1, we are going to focus, our text is going to be verse 8. And the title of this message is, A World Dependent on a Witness. Now we know that our world today is becoming more and more hostile towards the Christian. And it seems like there's more evil as the Lord's return draws closer and man is more godless than ever before. But little does this world realize that they need us and they are dependent on Christians to testify the good news of the gospel. Not only are we called to be salt and light while we're here on this earth, we are here to testify to the whole world that Jesus saves. I mean, how else is a lost sinner going to know that they can have their sins forgiven, right? How will they know unless someone who had their sins forgiven already tells them? Psalm 107, 2, verse 2, the Bible says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, so whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. How can a person who is on the broad road to destruction be shown the straight and narrow way unless someone who is on that path shows it to them. Romans 10, 14, the Bible says, How then shall they call in him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? A lost sinner who has not called upon the name of the Lord for salvation is a, is a terrible thing, amen? But even worse, 
is a sinner not believing because a person who professes to be saved never witnessed to them. How shall they believe in him of whom they have, and whom have they not heard? How? Consider what Paul said to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 15, 34. He says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. And he says, I speak this to your shame. Christian, can this be said about us? Can it be said about me? Is there lost among us in our daily goings who have not heard simply because we have not told them? If so, we are being disobedient to the Great Commission. If you can, put a marker in your Bible here in Acts chapter 1. We'll be back there. I'm going to go through a lot of scripture today, so if you follow, that would be great. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Verse 46. The Bible says, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. You see, the purpose of the Great Commission is to spread the gospel to a lost and dying world. It's to, to, it's to tell others about Jesus Christ. And this commission was given to us, the church. In verse 8 of our text, it reads, And ye shall be witnesses unto me. And this is one of the last things uh, that our Lord commands right before he ascends into heaven. Right? So the question is, what is a witness? What is a witness? A witness is one who testifies and gives evidence to what they have seen or heard by personal observation or experience. A witness is an individual who, being present, personally sees or, or perceives a thing. And the word martyr is also derived from the original Greek word for witness. And a martyr is a person who voluntarily suffers death as the penalty of witnessing and refusing to renounce their faith. And this is the Great Commission. It's, it's telling those who have not heard. We are called to give our lives so that others may know about Christ. John 20, 21, the Bible says, Then Jesus said to them, or Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even though, so send I you. It's us. It's our job to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, there are two requirements necessary for one to be a witness. One, a witness must have seen or experienced that about which he or seeks to bear witness. Now, let me use myself as an example. As I'm driving to work in the morning on my commute on the LIE to Northern State to get to Post Avenue to get to Westbury, let's say if I see two cars pulled over, one rear-ended the other one, and they're pulled over, and a cop is there. Now, if I go to the cop, I pull over, and I say, let me tell you what happened. He's going to say, wait, did you, see what, did you see what happened, how this accident happened? And I say, no, 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 but I still want to tell you what happened. He's going to say, beat it, get out of here, I don't, I don't need you. You're not a witness. So a witness has to be someone who actually experienced or seen an event. The second requirement to be a witness is a witness must tell others what he or she, ha he or she has seen. If you keep what you have experienced or seen to yourself then you're not a witness. You have to tell others. Concerning our text in, in verse 8, Spurgeon said a witness is one who gives testimony to an event, person, or circumstance. So a witness is, is one who has seen something, experienced something, heard something. For three and a half years, these apostles had lived intimately with the Savior, and now as a result of their contact with the Holy Spirit and his provision of power, they are going to be totally different people. Up until now, the apostles have been living primarily in their own strength, and the results have not been too impressive. Now, they're going to be the Savior's witnesses in the power of the Spirit. And that brings us to our first point, number one, the command to witness. Let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
the Bible says, but ye shall, be, ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we find here, for us who are saved, witnessing is not an option. It's not an option. Now we know that every person, not every person who is saved is called to be a preacher. Not everyone is called to be a missionary in a foreign land. Not everyone can sing in the choir or even play an instrument. Amen? I can't. We all have our own gifts or gifts that shall be used accordingly. But every single saved person is commanded to be a witness. This is not an option. You cannot neglect or, or, or refuse witnessing. You, you know, it's not like you know, some people you know, say, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't clean, I don't, I, don't, I don't clean bathrooms, I'm not doing that. That's fine, but when it comes to witnessing, you're supposed to be a witness. You're commanded. You shall be witnesses. I mean, if you, if you did that, it would be a dereliction of our, of our Christian duty, right? I mean, we know Christians can make up all kinds of excuses on, on why they don't witness, why, I, I, you know, I don't have time, I don't see people, or maybe there's fear involved, right? But we, we need to do away with any fears that we have that are associated with witnessing. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. We are not to fear man, but rather fear God and, and be obedient to what he has commanded us. I mean, we can't use the excuse, well, uh, I'm not a good speaker, or, or I don't have the opportunity, or, or, you know, I'm not around many people, I'm home all day. These are all just excuses. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? We get rejected? So what? I've been rejected plenty of times, right? If, if, if fear of rejection is what's holding us back from witnessing, it's really just a form of pride. I mean, we, we're going to get rejected. The Lord was rejected. We need to understand that they're not rejecting us, necessarily. They're rejecting the Lord, right? It says in John uh, 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but it, me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So we need to get that out of our mind and stop worrying about our feelings and how we feel, or I, I don't want to be rejected. It's not our job. Our job is just to give people the gospel. Matter of fact, we should wear it as a badge of honor if we suffer for his name's sake. Is that what uh, Paul and Silas did when they were beaten in the stocks, right? The apostles did that. They, 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 they uh, rejoiced that they had the, the privilege of suffering for Jesus Christ. Then we see, under the command to witness, we see one, or letter A, man needs and depends on a witness because of his, we see number one, his depravity his depravity. Mankind suffers beneath the burden of sin. They are estranged from God without hope in themselves because of their uh, depraved, sinful nature. I think of uh, the book of Jonah, when the Lord wanted Jonah to go into the Ninevites to witness to them because of their sin. In Jonah 1.1, the Bible says, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. Man is depraved. It's our nature. We're sinners. The will of man, of the natural man, is the worst part about him. The worst thing he has, the greatest enemy he has, is his own heart and will. It is the corrupt will of man, his sinful nature, that keeps him under the power of his sins. The Bible speaks in, in, in Jeremiah that our hearts are desperately wicked above all things. Before salvation in his natural state, man is dead in trespasses and sins. The word of God describes it as being without Christ, without hope. I believe in Ephesians it says that you're aliens to the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise. Man needs to hear that it is his own sin that separates him from God. And we see that in Isaiah 59 too. The Bible says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So we see that man needs and depends on a witness because of his depravity. And we also see because of his, number two, his despair. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9.
Let's look at verse 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus said mankind is like sheep without a shepherd. Man is lost. He's blind. He's, he's unprotected. Man is just wandering through life. They're, you know, he's seeking to fill voids that only God can fill. That's why he turns to drugs. That's why he turns to alcohol. That's why they turn to relationships. They're trying to fill this void in their heart that's vacated because of sin that only God can fill. And that's why it's never enough. As an addict or as an alcoholic or whatever the sin is, it's never enough. It's always a little more, a little more. Why? Because it's never satisfying. They are without leadership or guidance. They're following their own ways. They're without God's uh, 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 presence. Man is, is, is just bound to go astray without the Lord. And then we see man needs and depends on a witness because of his, number three, his destiny. His destiny. Let's turn a couple pages back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 13, the Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. So we see that man's destiny without Christ is going to be facing the Lord at the great white throne of judgment, and then the final destination is going to be the lake of fire. In Revelation 20.10, the Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In verse 15, And whosoever... Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's the final destination, the lake of fire of, of lost family members, lost friends, lost co-workers. All why? Because they were not witnessed to? Because they didn't hear? Paul said, I count that to your shame. The teeming of billions of lost souls around us who have not yet to hear the message of God's saving grace. We know that souls throughout Bangladesh, Africa, China, Mexico, the Caribbean, North and South America, all over the globe. The major cities teeming with lost and dying souls in New York, Los Angeles, Beijing, Tokyo. Millions and millions, billions of people lost and on the road to hell. So, when we witness, what should our message be to help these people? We see that we are to witness the gospel message. Let's turn our Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Verse 15, a familiar portion of Scripture. The Bible says in saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. So we see... If believing the gospel is what saves, it only makes sense that it's what we preach. In our witnessing, we don't have to debate people on doctrine or, or have a back and forth trying to convince the lost. We don't have to do that. Just give them the gospel. We're a messenger. Pastor always gives the illustration because, you know, of course I work for the post office. I'm a mailman. You, you just go and you just deliver the message. You don't have to follow up in the sense where you have to make sure that they do this or do that. Just give him the message. Jesus saves. The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Believing the gospel is what saves, and that's the message we should preach, is the gospel, the death, 
the burial and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we saw this verse earlier. Let's turn there. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. And it's Luke's account of the Great Commission. Luke 24. Verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, again the gospel, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses, ye are witnesses of these things. So the Bible says it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the, th the third day. Now this word behooved means it was necessary. It was necessary that Christ died and was buried and rose again the third day. Again, the gospel, this is what we preach, but it's not finished. He says, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. Now, I know there's a, a certain amount of preachers out there or people out there who, and I don't understand why, they say that repentance isn't needed. I mean, this is what the Great Commission, what you know, Jesus is saying here, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. It's needed. Repentance is essential in salvation. The Lord is clear on this matter, and it's throughout the Scriptures. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached. Now, remission of, remission of sins means full pardon, it means freedom and complete deliverance from the bondage that sin keeps us in. And that's what we want. That's what happens when the, when the sinner repents and places his faith in Christ. Then we see, let us see, we are to witness with a life which authenticates the message of salvation. So, in order to testify of God's saving grace, you need to have a testimony. You need to have a testimony. You must be converted and, and to be able to testify of the life-changing event that took place in your life. I mean, if not, you can be a blind leader of the blind, and we know what happens. The end result is that you both are going to fall in the ditch. You don't want that. Now, let me ask this question. Christian, brethren, how is your testimony? How is my testimony? Do I have a life? Do you have a life that, that backs up your testimony or witness? It's very important. Very important. Let's go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Verse 7. The Bible says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. Where? In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say about you. So we see here, testimony is important. Our conversation is important. And, and faith without works is dead. Our works need to, to back up our profession. If not, you know what's going to happen? The lost will spot hypocrisy a mile away, and instead of being a help, you can be a stumbling block, and we don't want that. You know, we cannot say and, and, and then not do. Let's go to verse 11 of, of Titus chapter 2. The Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem, from us, redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. So we find here that grace not only saves us, but it also teaches us holiness and, 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 and holy living. And the Bible says, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So we want to make sure that we're living holy lives to be an example to people. We want to be living epistles, seen and read of men, or known of men. 
So we saw our first point, the command to witness, and now we see our second point, the characteristics of witnessing. Let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, the Bible says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So we see here the master soul winner was the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the model for us to emulate when it comes to witnessing and, and winning souls. The Lord, when you read the scriptures and, and the gospels and his interactions, he dealt with every single person differently. He did not have a, a, a cookie cutter approach to witnessing, right? He, he, he was different with, 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 with different people. Note the master soul winner at work with the declared self-righteous leader, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus, he was a ruler of the Jews who privately sought out the Lord. And we know that because the Bible says that he came at night to see Jesus. And in their first interaction, Christ was, he was confrontational. He was direct and he was discerning. And he also was knowledgeable. Now, when dealing with people, we sometimes have to be confrontational, just like the Lord was. But we have to do it in a Christ-like way. Amen? We want to, you know, emulate our Lord in his style, but we also have to do it in his spirit. We, the Lord says, you know, learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. We want to do everything in meekness. The pastor said it many times. You don't want to be a, a, a bull in a china shop, right? You, you want to win that person who you're trying to win to Christ. You want to win them to yourself first. And if you turn them off and that wall comes up, it may be hard to deal with someone. You have to be careful. You want to be confrontational, and you also want to be direct and to the point when dealing with someone about their soul. You don't want to, you know, beat around the bush, right? Stay on message, the gospel, right? Don't get sidetracked or into debates. The Bible tells us about arguing foolish things like genealogies and, and science falsely so-called. We don't want to get into scientific debates. I mean, there's a, there's a time and a place for that, but, you know, when you're dealing with someone's soul, don't get into silly debates with people. Just give them the gospel. You want to be discerning. Discerning. And you want to, you want to know the person's needs spiritually. That is why it's always a, a must that we're spirit-filled. Finally, you want to be knowledgeable. Knowledgeable. You want to be able to answer any question the person might have and, and, and counter with any false belief that they may have, right? In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, right? To know the Bible, to know doctrine, to know, you know, different, uh, I guess, uh, doctrines, you have to study it. How are you going to know it? You have to read it, and it, it takes work. You have to be a workman, there's no secret recipe to it. You have, to, you have to study the Word. The Word of God has all the answers. And Jesus, he was fully aware of the false doctrine that Nicodemus held. And Jesus, he wasted no time in dealing with him. He tells him right off the bat, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, when Nicodemus re re replies with the silly question, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and, 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 and be born? Jesus stays laser-focused, and he gives him the truth again. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus here is telling him that there's a physical birth, and there must also be a spiritual birth. Nicodemus was perplexed right, he, by the statement from the Lord, and he finally asked, like, how can these things be? How can it be? And Jesus responds, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? The Lord here, he, he challenges Nicodemus on what he believes. He was skillful in dealing with the religious Pharisee. And again, we all should adopt the Lord's approach that we see here. We have to be discerning. We have to be confrontational, direct, and knowledgeable when it comes to dealing with people. And then we see when dealing with other Pharisees, the Lord Jesus was even more direct, and some would even say harsh. But again, the Lord was discerning and told them what they needed to hear. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Verse 
verse 13, excuse me, verse 13, Jesus said, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall see the greater damnation. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, ye make him twofold uh, more of the child of hell than yourselves. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. What a message to these religious Pharisees that he, that he gave them just now. And then look at verse 23. He continues. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye have to have done and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and you swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I mean, if there was any question on what type of preacher the Lord was, these portions of Scripture should answer that. He was fiery when he had to be. And this is exactly what these religious leaders needed to hear at that time. Now let's consider the woman at the well in John chapter 4. You can turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Now notice the master soul winner at work with the declared sinner. He uses a totally different approach than we, what we just witnessed with the religious leaders. First we see in John chapter 4, in verse 4, that he seeks an opportunity. He seeks an opportunity. The Bible says, and he must needs go through Samaria. So we see here that we have to be strategic in, in our witnessing and who are we going to witness to. I mean, you don't want to go to your job on the first day and just start, like, you know, witnessing to everybody. You have to be, you know, somewhat strategic about it. Not that you can do that, but, like, I know some places don't allow that. And, you know, in my place at the post office, if you start talking outside of your case, you're going to get it called out on the loudspeaker. <laughs> so you can't do that. But you can talk to the person that's right next to you. Amen? You can talk to people who you're training. Amen? You know, stuff like that. You have to be strategic. And we see again, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour that cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me a drink. So he starts off the conversation with a simple request. Please give me some water. Now Jesus here is demonstrating how simple, small talk can lead into a spiritual conversation. He seeks an opportunity. Give me a drink. Then we see he presents the truth. He presents the truth. Let's scroll down to verse 13. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that, that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of springing water, or springing up into everlasting life. Excuse me, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So he gives her the truth. He then confronts her sin. Verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast 
Well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that said thou truly. Now let's go down to verse 25. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah, Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Now note how this woman, she gets converted and she cannot wait to go and tell people her testimony. She cannot wait. She goes into the city, the Bible says, and, and left her water pot right there where it was. And where's the emphasis throughout her testimony? It's all about Christ. Come see a man which told me all the things that I ever did. Is this not the Christ? Is it not the Christ? She didn't have to know every single Bible doctrine, right? She didn't have to know every Old Testament commandment or about end time prophecy. All she knew that there was a man that told her of all her sin and he saved her. Is this not the Christ? Let's turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Verse 34, let's now note the Apostle Peter's soul-winning mastery. In Acts chapter 10, verse 34, the Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is, is accepted of him, with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even unto us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead, to give him all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them all, which heard the word. So we see here in Acts 10, uh, Peter's dealing with Cornelius and, and those Gentiles that were with him, and he gives them the gospel. He tells them of Christ's death, his burial, his resurrection. And we also see that Paul testifies of, of, of being an eyewitness and gives testimony of, of Christ's resurrection. Peter testifies that he ate and he drank with the Lord after he rose from the dead, so he was a, a firsthand witness. He saw the risen Lord with his own eyes. He was not going by what, else, what somebody else told him. He's telling you what he saw. He saw Jesus. He was dead, he was buried, and he rose again. He's testifying. He's a witness to it. And then we see the Apostle Paul as he confronts false professors. Let's go to Acts 19. Acts 19. Verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. In verse 4, Paul says, then Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So notice when the apostle deals with these certain disciples, he's asking a probing question, right? He's trying to 
dig a little deeper. He asked if they received the Holy Ghost since they believed. And sometimes when witnessing or, or even listening to someone's testimony, you have to listen and, and you have to just try to just, you know, dig a little deeper. You have to ask questions to get to the bottom of whether that person is saved or not. And the answer that Paul got helped him in how he had to deal with these certain disciples. He then points them to Christ, and then they end up uh, getting saved and being baptized in the name of Christ. Then we see how Paul instructed Titus on how to deal with false professors. False professors. Let's go to Titus. Let's go back to Titus. Let's go to chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work reprobate. So we see false professors are blinded by religion and self-righteousness, and Paul instructs Timothy to rebuke them sharply. So there's a time and a place where there needs to be rebuke when it comes to false doctrine. Then we see there are certain requirements for being a successful witness. One, we must, well, we must possess and, and, and be filled with the Spirit. And why is the Spirit critical in our witness? We see, number one, Without the Spirit, there will be no conviction. Without the Spirit, there's no conviction. We need the Holy Spirit to convict the hearts of men. It's the Spirit's uh, uh, um, job to do that, to, to convict men of their sin. And that's why when you listen to people's uh, salvation testimony, you want to hear, like Pastor always says, when was there a time when the Spirit convicted you of your sin? Amen? That's very important. See, number two... Without the Spirit, there'll be no conversions. John 6, 63, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Without the Spirit, there will be no spiritual growth. We need to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need the Spirit's help with that by reading and studying and, and being filled with the Spirit. And then we see number four, without the Spirit, all preaching and witnessing is in vain. Romans 8, 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. We must be spirit-led. It is he who knows the heart and mind of the sinner. All people, all conditions are not the same. We cannot force Christ on people. It's just not going to happen. You can't do that. No one was ever shoved onto the narrow way or, or through the straight gate. Spirit-controlled witnessing is necessary when dealing with the poor, lost sinner. And that's how it always should be. Again, in meekness, the Apostle Paul instructs the faithful pastor Timothy, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves, recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy 2.25. See, it's not in our ability to try to convince someone, it's the spirit that does the work. We need to just give the message and, and trust that we're spirit-led. Also, when Paul testified in Philippians 3, 4, he was very clear about his own personal testimony. In Philippians 3, 4, you don't have to turn there, I'll just read it. The Bible says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, he says, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, 
and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me? Those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of, the knowledge of, the, of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness, righteousness which is of God by faith. So in his testimony here, Paul, uh, he tells of, of his background before salvation, he tells us of his former religious experience before salvation, his upbringing before salvation, his confrontation from the Lord. He gives the details of his conversion, and he gave all the details of his testimony right here in one short paragraph. Now, we all know we can have the detailed long version of how we were saved, but really all you need to do is give people that quickly the short version that hits all the points. We should be able to clearly explain how God saved us through Jesus Christ. And again, witnessing is not about just emptying your head and, and trying to prove how much Bible you know and, and coming out with a whole bunch of factoids. Sometimes we get, get caught up in that, thinking that you know, the power is, is within us and that we have to try to coerce people. But no, it's, it's, it's about being obedient and giving them the gospel and being filled with the Spirit. So one, we saw the command to witness. Then we saw the characteristics of witnessing. And that brings us to our final point, the constructive witness. Let's go back to our text in Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So, here are a few things to consider to give a good testimony. One, you need a clear, scriptural, personal testimony. Ask yourself this question. Does your testimony line up with the Bible? Can you back up your testimony with scripture? It never ceases to amaze me of all the unscriptural testimonies you can hear when you, I mean, just talking about pastors who, who fill the pulpit. I mean, that's why we say that, you know, childhood evangelism is wrong. You can't be saved at, at the age of three. I mean, that's the unscriptural. Make sure that your testimony lines up with the Bible. We want to base everything on the Bible, the Word of God. Number two, always be ready to present your testimony. Again, you want to look for opportunities. You want to be strategic. You want to always have tracks ready. And that's something that, you know, that I know we all need to work on, including myself, is, is making sure that we always have tracks clean and ready. You don't want to have like a track that has like the corners bent and has a coffee stain on it or sitting in, your, in, your, in the, the side of your door there, catching rain and like all smeared and blurred. You don't want that. That's a bad testimony. Give someone a clean, you know, gospel track. That's what you want. And again, look for opportunities. Have them ready to go. Number three, ask the Lord for boldness, clarity of mind, and compassion. And I do that all the time when I, you know, I speak to someone. I try to ask the Lord to help clear my mind because I know how my mind works. It runs like, you know, 100 miles an hour while my mouth is not as fast or maybe vice versa. I don't know. But you want to ask for clarity and you want to be able to, to give the message that God wants you to give them in a clear, concise manner. And you want to have compassion. You don't want to just, you know, look down at people and be like, oh, you know, he doesn't need a track. He, he'll never get saved or she, she, this is not for her. Have compassion. You know, preach the gospel to all creatures, the Bible says. All nations. Again, a witness does not need to be eloquent. They don't have to be convincing, clever, or persuasive, articulate, or uh, even a seminary graduate. The greatest evangelist of the 1800s and probably of all time was uh, D.L. Moody, who had only a fifth grade education, and yet the spirit-filled and empowered man was used by God to witness to more than 100 million souls. Remember, God is not interested in your ability to be his witness. 
Think about Moses. Moses had a speech impediment, and God still used him to do uh, uh, a mighty work. He's not interested in your ability, but in your availability. Are you available? We're all available to be a witness, right? You shall be witnesses. A witness for Jesus simply needs to tell others what they know to be true. Everything that we're taught here, you know, we're a well-taught church. Amen? We need to go and take that and bring it to the world outside these doors. George Whitfield, arguably the most famous preacher during the Great Awakening in America, once said, God forbid that I should travel with anybody for a quarter of an hour without speaking to them of Christ. Spurgeon preached, God save us from living in comfort while sinners are sinking into hell. We saw what man's destiny is, the great white throne of judgment, and then eventually the lake of fire. I mean, God help us if we don't witness to someone in, in that day we see them getting tossed, bound hand and foot into the lake of fire. That's why God says he has to wipe away all tears eventually, because there's going to be regret. And finally, from the scriptures, the Bible says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15. So, what are you going to do with this message that we just received? What am I going to do? You know, I'm sure all the men that come up here would amen this. When you come up here, I hope... The, the church has to think that like we're just preaching to you guys. This has an effect on us when we study it out. And I know I've fallen short in my witness, and I can do so much better. And I think as a church we can do better. Let's just look around and see how many empty seats we have here that should be filled. We need to be doing our job in, in, in getting this church filled and, and, and winning souls for the Lord before the, the, the trumpet sounds. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for the message. So thankful for the book of Acts. I'm so thankful for the Great Commission. Pray, Father, that you would help us to make the necessary adjustments. Help us, Lord, to be a better witness. Let us use the examples of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the scriptures that he gives us for a reason. These things are written for us as examples and how to witness, how to win souls for Christ. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Pray for the lost that if they're not saved, that they would place their faith in Christ and repent of their sins before it's too late. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.